Hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to the LSE for this uh, evening's event, which falls past as the LSE's festival, uh, Beverage 2.0, taking place um, from last Monday to, uh, until Saturday, uh, part of a whole year of activities looking at rethinking the welfare state for the 21st century, and indeed for a more sort of global context. My name's Julian Legrand. Um, I'm professor at the LSE's Marshall Institute, um, uh, and I'm going to be chairing the session. Um, we have, um, we're going to be exploring the contribution of voluntary action to the fight um, against the Beverages Five Giants and other, some of the other missing giants as well. Um, Beveridge himself explicitly, ex explicitly explored such a role um, in his report, his third report, um, uh, called Voluntary Action, which most people haven't, uh, haven't read or haven't heard of. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's a, but it is a question that challenged a lot of other leading thinkers at the LSE um, over the years. Beatrice Webb, uh, Ralph Darendorf, uh, director of LSE, and our more recent director, Anthony Giddens, um, have all contributed to the debate uh, and is very much a live issue these days. Um, I am very pleased to welcome three panellists uh, today. Um, I'm afraid it is only three. Unfortunately, Susan Leotard, our fourth, um, is ill and so cannot join the panel today, um, as we heard um, a few hours ago. Um, <clears throat> but the panel that we do have is immensely distinguished. We have um, Sir Thomas Hughes Hallett. Uh, who is uh, a non, who has been a non-profit chief executive, foundation trustee, a philanthropist, and a founder of an investment bank. Uh, in 2011, he chaired the Philanthropy Review and Independent Assessment of uh, British Philanthropy. He's currently chair of Chelsea and Westminster Hospital Foundation Trust, but his chief claim to fame, uh, and the thing for which we are all deeply grateful for, to him for, is that he is one of the co-founders of the Marshall Institute. Uh, uh, where he's a professor of practice. His latest social venture, uh, Help Force, uh, uses voluntary support, voluntary action to support state health and social care in the UK. Jonathan Roberts um, is teaching director and senior lecturer of practice at the Marshall Institute. He leads the development of teach our teaching activities um, at the Institute, including a new executive MSc programme in social business and entrepreneurship, uh, and also a Marshall Institute specialism within the LSE's Master in Public Administration uh, program, the MPA in Social Impact. Uh, Kauza Zaman is a lawyer uh, at uh, Allen and Overy uh, and a social mobility ambassador for the Law Society of England and Wales. Born and raised in East London, uh, he was the first in his family to go to university, graduated with the first in law from the LSE in 2012. Before um, uh, a reading for the BCL at Oxford University and the LLM at Harvard Law School as a Fulbright Scholar, <coughs> he served as a commissioner on the Citizens Commission on Islam, Participation and Public Life, uh, and in 2009 was a global fellow of the Prime Minister. I rather like the idea of being a global fellow of the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit, a bit more about that. Uh, uh, Kazar is a trustee of Toynbee Hall in, uh, in Whitechapel, uh, the very place where Beveridge, as warden, cut his teeth on social issues at the start of the 20th century. Um, each of them is going to speak for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we will um, open the discussion to, uh, for us all to make contributions uh, as, we, as we like. Um, a few uh, housekeeping matters for those Twitter users in the audience. The hashtags uh, for today's event are uh, hash LSE beverage and hash LSE festival. Um, I'd ask you to please put your phones on, on silent uh, so as not to disrupt the event, which reminds, reminds me whether I put my own phone on silent, but I will check that when I'm finished here. Uh, the event is being recorded. Uh, and hopefully will be made available in a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. Um, so without further ado, I shall ask Jonathan to lead us off. Good 
Julian, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I'm in that husky stage. Um, I have got some pastels over there, so if I have a Theresa May moment, I will. Like <laughs> I've got the I've got the Philip Hammond. I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, so Julian will be my Philip Hammond. Um, <laughs> It's great to see you all here to discuss leverage and voluntary action. In um, 1948, Beveridge produced this third report, um, but it really didn't make much of an impact at all. Unlike the Beveridge plan, there were no queues on Kingsway to buy this report, and it was largely forgotten. I even had a quick look on Beveridge's Wikipedia page, and there is no reference to voluntary action there. I think it was a report and a document which was just out of time. Uh, it was re a report on voluntary action at the very moment when we were moving towards the welfare state, when we were moving away from perhaps patchy, amateurish voluntary action in favour of the professionalised state. But in the last 30 years or so, we could argue about how long, things have changed a bit, I think, and voluntary action is looking an increasingly interesting document. Um, there's been a loss of faith in the state and the market in solving difficult social problems, and there's been an increasing interest in whether the voluntary sector and voluntary action can in some sense make a contribution. In the UK, we have had various manifestations of this. It's been called the third way, the compact between the voluntary sector and the government, the big society. And we've had, at the same time, heavy increases in the amount of government funding of voluntary organisations We've had continual efforts to encourage and increase volunteering. Um, in England and Wales as well, our hospitals as foundations, our schools as academies, are in some sense strange hybrid organisations on the boundaries of the state and the voluntary sector. So it's a good moment to think again about voluntary action and its contribution to the welfare state. Before I do that, we need to do that academic thing, and that is define what we're talking about. Um, Henry James in 1921 um, wrote an extremely impenetrable preface to uh, one of his books in which he was talking about Tolstoy among others, and said the books of Tolstoy were loose and baggy monsters. Um, <clears throat> this rather memorable phrase was taken up by a group of LSE academics in the 1990s to describe the voluntary sector. And I like it. I like it for two reasons. First, if we're going to apply war and peace to the voluntary sector, I can live with that. Um, we're talking about passion, we're talking about intrigue, we're talking about all different levels of society, and we're talking about something that maybe goes on and on and on. Um, but also, it just conveys that sense that, unlike maybe the market and the state, we just never really know where voluntary action begins and ends. We've got the smallest grassroots organisations, a book reading club is part of our sector. We've also got these vast non-profits with many, many paid staff paying salaries or 100,000, 200,000 or more. It's an incredibly diverse sector. Um, Beveridge himself defined it as private action for public purpose, which is outside the family. That's a pretty good definition. He also helped us by identifying two very different streams. One was mutuality, so people coming together to help themselves and each other, self-help, the obvious examples being the Friendly Society, the Mutual Savings Society, Building Societies. And then there was philanthropy. That's when, of course, we help others. We're not helping ourselves at the same time. 
although of course economists might say we get a warm glow from our actions. Um, but that's based on altruism, whereas mutuality is a sophisticated shared self-interest. So that's one important distinction when we're thinking about how voluntary action might support the welfare state. The second important distinction is to be aware we're talking both about volunteers, unpaid labour, but also those voluntary organisations which fulfil their social mission through using large numbers of paid professional staff. Both tonight will come under our term uh, voluntary action. So that's the academic definition over. Um, what I'm going to do is briefly go through three policy areas where I think the voluntary sector, voluntary action has some role to play in our contemporary welfare state. And then I'm going to describe two challenges for voluntary action. Some of the time I'm going to invoke Beveridge because I think he still has things to say to us. But other times I'm not because his voice is 75 years old and things have changed. So we will have other perspectives too. So on to my first um, whoops, did I see? On to my first policy challenge, and that is public services. Um, we probably all know the story of public services at the moment. Um, there's austerity, but beyond austerity, there's also a real concern about whether the state, given demographic, demographic trends, um, given other demand side pressures, whether the state can continue to meet demand. So what can the voluntary sector do? Well, Beveridge argued quite strongly, and these are plausible um, suggestions, that in some sense voluntary organisations can be more responsive, more personal, more specialist. And in certain categories of public services, they can just do a better job. It's, it's very difficult to get strong empirical evidence of comparisons in this area, but it's a very plausible idea. Um, he gave the example of um, his own national insurance and state benefits. He gave a very passionate speech in the House of Lords because he was so upset at the way things were going. He wanted national insurance and state benefits to be delivered through the existing friendly societies but the government decided not to do that so just did it through state mechanisms and so the contrast which Beveris drew was of the um, benefits just coming through the post from an impersonal inhuman state which is how it has been since the start of the welfare state and he compared that to what a friendly society would do which would be to, if someone was sick, that they would send a visitor to take the benefits to that person and offer them support and advice and sympathy. So humanity. I think Beveridge is being a touch idealistic there because what in history friendly starters also did was use those visitors to check whether people were really sick and uh, snoop around to see whether they were going shopping and these sorts of things, much like the current welfare state, but nonetheless there is that point of the voluntary sector offering some sort of human humanity, human touch. Um, there's also a point strongly made by Beveridge which many commentators make as well, and that is that voluntary organisations, voluntary action are a place of creativity a place where you can do social innovation without worrying about consumer demand in the market or worrying about what voters think in the state. It's a good argument. We're not saying that every voluntary organisation is innovative. That's obviously not true. But the phrase used by Ralph Darendorf, a creative chaos, I think is a good way of representing the non-profit sector. So finding new ways of solving social problems. And I wonder as well if we are a little unambitious about our use of volunteers in public services. Exactly a hundred years ago, another LSE luminary, Beatrice Webb, 
suggested a volunteer army of health visitors who would go and sort out families who had problems. I think that suggestion probably tests a little bit our modern sensibilities. Um, I would tend to think that the health visitor should, should be a professional paid person. But nonetheless, maybe there are places where we can have uh, volunteers doing a job which is as good or maybe even better than what paid staff can do. So there's some interesting recent research into volunteers who are going in to talk to people who are in end-of-life situations and evaluations have been very, very good. Uh, something to do with the nature of the transaction which goes on between the volunteer and the person who is facing the end of life. And we mustn't forget too that in the UK we do have volunteer policemen, volunteer firemen, volunteer judges in the form of magistrates, so there are precedents for this. Um, but as I talk about the voluntary sector being involved in public services, one big caveat, uh, beverage like many others, um, was very strong that there had to be a clear separation of voluntary action and the state. Um, he, like so many people of that time, had seen what Nazi Germany was like. Um, Darren Dorf, uh, one of his successors at LSE, similarly had the same approach. Um, and there's a problem here with the degree of involvement of non-profits, voluntary sector, with the state. In the UK, about 30% of non-profit funding is now from government, and that rises to 50% in fields like social care or employment and training. And we've also seen recently things like the lobbying acts in the UK where there appeared to be some restriction on the ability of voluntary organisations to campaign and gagging clauses in contracts between the government and non-profits. So we have to be to guard against infringements of the independence of voluntary action. So that's my first policy area of public services. My second is disconnection. If I had that missing giant, which we're all encouraged to vote for in this festival, well, my vote would be the disempowerment and disconnection which people are feeling at the moment, that sense that they have no power, that things are being done to them and not by them or with them. Um, and I think voluntary associations, voluntary action has a part to play in a small way in repairing that sense of disconnection. I think in Beveridge's discussion of friendly societies you can see a flavour of that um, empowerment, of that connection between people. Um, there's a sort of lovely image as you read voluntary action of people gathering in the pub, because it normally was the pub <coughs> where the friendly societies met, and talking through um, the structures, the financial uh, budgets of their mutual organisations, a sense of conviviality, of um, some sort of being in control. Um, one of my favourite bits is he's quoting a uh, commission which looked into friendly societies, and one of the friendly societies had a rule in its constitution that five shillings had to be spent on beer for the friendly society meeting. I think this is one of the earliest examples of behavioural economics that I've come across. <laughs> it's a fantastic incentive. But then subsequently the same society introduced a bylaw which said that the agenda had to be completed before beer was drunk. So I, it's, it's a lovely sense and it's a sense of coming together to achieve something for your community and your families, and also conviviality at the same time. So I just wonder whether voluntary organisations and associations can, in some sense, uh, bring that back. We have mechanisms and organisations which have the potential to do that. Um, things like multi-stakeholder social cooperatives, tenant management organisations, um, various forms of community governance and parks and public places, community interest companies, but it's a very fragmented picture. 
I know it's all very hard, there's no doubt about that, but there is potential there for the voluntary association maybe to get rid of some of that disconnection to bring a bit of power back to people. Um, so, on to my third policy area. Um, I've called it accountability, but what I mean by that is voluntary action and voluntary associations holding the market and the state to account. Increasingly holding the state to account through um, elections every five years looks so a very weak instrument. Um, holding the market to account by not buying something is also a very weak instrument for certain externalities. So it's the role of voluntary associations, organisations in challenging the state and the markets. We can identify easily the big players in this field, it's Human Rights Watch, it's Greenpeace, it's these sorts of organisations. But it's also very much that loose and baggy monster is happening at the local level as well with community groups, community action. So in a very complex and fragmented world, that's a very powerful role that voluntary action needs to play. Um, another favourite organisation of mine is the Marine Stewardship Council, a non-profit which is doing a very good job of sustaining fish supplies around the world. So that's my three policy areas. I'm now going to move very quickly to two challenges which voluntary action, the voluntary sector faces. Um, the first of those is the market. Um, much of what I've said so far has been about the relationship between non-profits, voluntary action and the state. But increasingly, voluntary action is coming into contact with the markets. Um, we often hear now charities being called business markets. They have strategic plans. Um, in this fuzzy area between the voluntary sector and the market, we have social enterprises, we have um, social impact investments, we have venture philanthropy. Now, I'm actually quite positive about these developments, but one has also to acknowledge that there are deep fears here. The market transactions, the market way of interacting with others is somehow invading our social space, our moral space. So that's a very dynamic and challenging area for voluntary action. And my final um, challenge, my final point, is perhaps unsurprisingly trust. Uh, trust is in many ways the lifeblood of voluntary action, whether trusting in your fellow citizen to come together in an act of mutuality, or whether as a donor giving your money to a voluntary organisation and trusting them to do something good with that. And I think probably for the first time trust in charities, trust in voluntary action is beginning to waver. Um, obviously we've had Kids Company in the UK. We've had a fundraising scandal in the UK. Now, very sadly, we have Oxfam. But I also think it's something more than that, and actually something almost uh, more significant in the long-term future of voluntary sector and voluntary action. And that is a question of whether voluntary organisations are actually effective. So we have effective altruism movements, which is saying, actually, what is the evidence that you as a voluntary organisation are changing anything, are using this money wisely? So the question that we're left with, which I think voluntary action is going to have to grapple with, is that now maybe um, wanting to do good is no longer enough. You've got to show that you are doing good. Can I first of all uh, start off by saying um, how great it is uh, for me to be here at the LSE. Uh, only a few years ago in 2012 I graduated um, and this uh, lecture theatre brings a lot of memories uh, because the door is at this corner and if you arrive 10 minutes late at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, you've got a lecture <coughs> theatre looking at you as you walk in and I used to end up in that corner. Uh, so I think 
the LSE is really uh, the home of radical thinking and very much in the beverage tradition um, the LSE has uh, established the Marshall Institute and as I was saying to Jonathan earlier I think the LSE is really um, the perfect place to develop that kind of thinking because when I was here as a student we had the huge bill going through Parliament to increase tuition fees at the time and there were thousands of students protesting and that was for me in many ways an example of where people in the community, uh, students in this case, gathering together on an important issue and campaigning uh, to have that changed. My own experiences uh, within the voluntary sector or the community sector is um, a fairly interesting one in that I've come through it or to it through, through my own background. I was uh, the youngest of seven siblings in my family. My parents came over uh, to this country in the 1970s, like many communities uh, from Bangladesh, and they settled in Brick Lane, one of the poorest communities. Um, there were seven of us. My father passed away um, when I was fairly young, so my mother was left to raise seven of us. And what really got me to university to the LSE, to Oxford, to Harvard, was to do in part with the determination I had. But more importantly, I felt like I was very lucky. I came into contact with the right people at the right time. So there were organisations in the community, and one to point out in particular is the Social Mobility Foundation, an organisation which was the brainchild of someone uh, who felt that social mobility was an incredibly important cause that we had to deal with. Um, lots of statistics out there now showing that if you grow up today as a young person, your life chances are worse than the life chances of your parents' generation because of living costs um, and other factors. So organisations like Social Mobility Foundation came to me at the right time and said, look, this is someone we need to help. And I come across in many voluntary roles that I serve in today with thousands of young people, particularly in the education sector, with a lot of talent, promise, potential. And what really strikes me is I don't think there is the capacity at the moment within the state sector to deal with some of the enormous challenges facing young people. So I think of, I'm a school governor at a um, school in Bethnal Green, very challenged community, people from lots of different backgrounds, second languages, third languages. And one of the biggest challenges we face today is, yes, their parents want them to do very well in education, to progress through the ranks, to enter the world of work. But where they, ch where they struggle is on the finance, so living costs huge. I'm a trustee of an organisation called Toynbee Hall and we recently published a report last year terming the issue facing people from these particular communities, the poverty premium, where if you come from a poor background, if you come from a disadvantaged background, you are much more likely to be growing up in a community which is disadvantaged, number one. You will go to school more often than not which is underperforming relative to other schools in the country. You are mo most likely to be in a position where your health is poorer or your access to health is poorer to, than others relatively. You will have situations where because of the community you live in, if you want to buy a car, to buy insurance, insurance is determined on the basis of postcode often if you live in that poor community, you're paying a lot more for your living costs. When you're dealing with bills, you find it a lot more difficult to negotiate better electricity prices, gas prices. These sound like quite small factors, but have a huge impact on some of the individuals that we at Toynbee Hall, for example, help and support. And the support we provide at Toynbee Hall, which I've not introduced yet, but is is an organisation based uh, in Orgate East. It was founded 
uh, in the late 19th century um, and at a centre where Beveridge at the age of uh, 24 came. He was a graduate of Baylor College, Oxford. And he came to Toynbee Hall and settled um, at what was known as a settlement house to work within in the community to learn about the challenges uh, that people from poorer communities uh, find. And we like to think at Toynbee Hall now uh, we could be influenced or that was the place where a lot of his ideas um, were very much uh, born. Uh, but he was a real advocate of living amongst communities and learning about their conditions to then inform civil society, to inform the state. And I think there's a huge, as, as the state increasingly finds it difficult to grapple with the big social problems in our communities, there's a very, very important <coughs> uh, community organisations. Just yesterday, for example, I was in a meeting uh, discussing uh, legal aid. So at Toynbee Hall, we have something called FLAC, the Free Legal Advice Centre, uh, where lawyers from the city come and devote dozens of hours during the course of each month uh, to help people without any provision to legal advice. The government's cut huge amounts of money from the legal aid budget, and we find people without any advice on debt, on housing, and increasingly now on um, we're getting a lot of cases on uh, EU nationals looking for advice on, on their immigration status. That's a huge area. If you think about, you know, I'm a student of law, if you think about the rule of law, we think about the importance of access to justice, that's a central and foundation, foundational pillar which has almost been ripped out. And it's civil society almost, which has come about lots of legal advice centres now filling that gap. <coughs> uh, there's lots of merits about the effectiveness of, the, of that legal provision, but there's a huge gap. And we as an organisation have found that over the last three years, 50, we've had an increase of 50% of service users. Historically it was within Tower Hamlets, within a, a small community in East London, but that's increased now uh, to across London because the demand is so great. So I, just generally, I, and just to wrap up, um, I'm conscious of time, um, I think it's a very central issue today, um, and I think the question of civil society playing its role, um, supporting the state crucially, um, is a, as important as it has ever been. In fact, because of the social pressures we find, um, we find our found our organisations like Toynbee Hall, that a lot more is being demanded. We provide, for example, um, government services. Um, so when the Department for uh, Communities decides to impart a programme specifically on debt advice, Toynbee Hall and civil society is often asked to deliver that service. So there is that connection between the state as well as uh, civil society organisations. Um, so I think the demand will increase. Um, I think we, within the sector, within the voluntary sector, need to become a lot more um, attentive to the changing circumstances. Um, and an interesting point which Jonathan touched on was about charities asking themselves, or, or voluntary organisations asking themselves about the impact they're having. We, I often find with my private sector hat on as a lawyer in my day-to-day -day job, we're asking increasingly charities questions about, we will give you £10,000 for this legal advice provision, what are you doing, how many people are you serving as part of that mandate that we give out, but importantly how are you working with other communities and other organisations to provide that service. So there's lots of strategic issues which charities themselves are increasingly facing um, and I'm sure we'll discuss some of this at June. Session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Kaiser. <coughs> Tom. Thank you. Um, so I'm Tom Hughes Hallett, um, and uh, I'm kind of obsessed by this subject, uh, as you'll find out over the next minutes. Um, I had a very career which Julian has already described 
um, rather like others. I bumped into the right people at the right time um, and uh, found myself in 2000 with wealth that I never dreamt I'd have um, and three children who said it would be lovely if you could do a job in future that we could be proud of. And this was a pretty seminal moment after practically killing myself uh, as a banker for 30 years to suddenly realize that my kids thought I was rubbish. Uh, rich rubbish, good at skiing holidays, uh, but that's about it. Um, and so um, it was a slightly sort of Paul on the road to Tarsus moment. I Seriously, actually, I, I, it was a life-changing moment. And I decided to become uh, a servant of the public in whatever way I could for the rest of my working life. And so for the next 12 years, I had the enormous privilege, best job I've ever had, uh, of running one of the great national charities, Marie Curie Cancer Care, or Marie Curie as it's called now. And I saw at first hand how in an organization that had 4,000 staff, its impact could be transformed by the 100,000 volunteers that I had supporting us. Um, only 10,000 of those really were every week. 90,000 of them bothered you with a tin if you live in this country and asked you to give money for a daffodil once a year. But do you know what? That raised six million pounds. <laughs> Uh, so thank you to those 90,000 people, uh, because that £6 million allowed us to pay for half of the Marie Curie Nursing Service, uh, which looks after one quarter of all people who die in this country. And that's all through volunteerism. So it's an, an extraordinary thought, really. I wonder who said this in 1942, to give you a clue. But do listen, because it's very important, and it's not... Sorry, I haven't started what you know who said. It's not at all what you've been led to believe that Beveridge and Nye Bevin wanted. This is, what they, this is what Beveridge actually wanted. The state, in organizing security, should not stifle incentive, opportunity, and responsibility. In establishing a national minimum, it should leave room and encouragement for voluntary action by each individual to provide more than that minimum for himself and for his family. So Beveridge's original dream was to create a state-supported security system in health and social care and other ways, but as a national minimum. And that what came on top of that should be provided by voluntary action. And somewhere between 1942 and 2018, we've forgotten that. And I think it was in the 60s and 70s and 80s that we began to think that what Beveridge and Bevan said was free care for all at the point of delivery. They never said it. But we've allowed ourselves to believe that. I pay my taxes, Governor. I expect the NHS to do everything for me, including many forms of procedure that, frankly, the NHS can't afford to provide for us all. That's the first thing. And then, and that's since I first read that, um, it's kind of steered the way I've taken my life over the last 18 years. And then in Even Illich, who was a great um, medical academic writing in the 1970s, and very unpopular with doctors, uh, but widely respected uh, internationally, read the, wrote the following. The level of public health corresponds to the degree to which the means and responsibility for coping with illness are distributed amongst the total population. This ability to cope can be enhanced, but never replaced by medical intervention. And then listen carefully. That society which can reduce professional intervention to the minimum will provide the best conditions for good health. And if you think about it now, some 40 years later, it's becoming to look very true that as we invent ever more effective drugs and ever more effective clinical care, we prolong our lives, we make huge improvements to our longevity. Many of us survive conditions that even 20 years ago would have killed us. 
But has the quality of our life improved at all, particularly at the end of our lives? So there's something here, too, about um, how an over-dependence on the state doesn't necessarily lead to nirvana. So I just wanted to tell you uh, in a, a few minutes uh, what this has inspired me to do. So I have decided to take voluntary action. And I'm going to give you the example of what I'm doing to help you understand why I think voluntary action <coughs> is the most wonderful supplement to what the state does. Never a replacement, but a supplement to what the state does to, to improve the quality of life of all. And to use a slightly more boring phrase, to make the system work better for all of us. So I, I chair acute care. If you live between Westminster and Heathrow, I'm afraid you're in my hands. Bad, bad luck. Uh, and I, so I chair the Chelsea and Westminster Foundation Trust, which stretches across that patch. And when I arrived four and a half years ago to be its chairman, I discovered that the demands on our services were rising exponentially. The amount of staff we had to deliver those services was declining, and the amount of money in real terms was at best flat. Twenty years ago, the average age of the patients we operated on was 64. The average age of patients coming through our operating theatres now is 82. 82, it's not amazing, actually. The average age of a first-time mother coming through, we are the second largest, um, in fact, possibly tonight, uh, increasing by one, because uh, I'm expecting a granddaughter literally at any minute. Uh, but um, um, the average age of our mums now is 32, first-time mothers, and the average age uh, on the maternity unit about four weeks ago, very large maternity unit, baby every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day, uh, was 36. And of course, the concomitant health risk is much greater. So, so we, we've got all these problems to deal with, and the state can't cope. And then I saw another statistic, I like statistics, which said that there are 3 million volunteers working in public service in this country. 850,000 school governors alone but only 76,000 volunteers working in hospitals. And I thought, this is bonkers. I couldn't work it out. But I don't know if any of you tried to volunteer in a hospital uh, recently. It'll take you 28 weeks. And you think you're giving a gift. But what we basically do is we, think we, we, we immediately accuse you of being a criminal and saying, you look dodgy, so we need to do a CRB check. And Jim is Savile, so we need to do one even more thoroughly. Uh, and then we make you go through occupational health to make sure you don't give us all cholera. But no, literally no one can remember why that policy was introduced. So we're also very bad at harnessing voluntarism in the NHS. So in a conceited way, um, although I'm not sure I'm conceited, but I'm very energetic, uh, I thought we would have a go through, vol through voluntary action at creating a community interest company which would bring together people with a like mind to myself to see if we could underpin the state with safe, reliable volunteers in brand new roles, in 21st century roles. And instead of going to the perception of an NHS volunteer, which is a white, middle-class, above-middle-aged woman, to actually engage with the whole gamut of ethnicity, of age groups, and of gender. And so far, the signs are incredibly exciting. <laughs> uh, we've been going for about 18 months. I've invested personally about £200,000. That's all it's taken. I mean, it's a lot of my money, but it's not a lot of money. in term The state could not have done this for £200,000. And we're now covering a population of 10 million people. And we're beginning to look at new roles for volunteers within the state system that will take care to a different level but never replacing the paid staff. So it might also interest you to know that one of the perceived biggest obstacles to volunteerism are amongst my biggest supporters. So the Royal College of Nursing, the Nursing Union sits on my board. Unison are right behind me because their members are, what are they? They're exhausted. They are 
desperate for help. And if someone can give them trained, safe, reliable volunteers to support them, bring it on. So what we're doing is, what do you call it? The baggy chaos, what was it? The baggy loose monsters. And, the loose and baggy monster. The loose and baggy monster, and you used chaos in another phrase. To uh, create, that. Creative chaos. The word, creative chaos. Yeah. The combination of the loose and baggy monster and creative chaos. And after 15 months, we're beginning to think that what looked like a crazy idea could become a reality. So, and the state loves it. So today, and so does the, the corporate world. So today I've sat in the boardroom of the largest bank in the world, looking at how their staff in this country can volunteer to support healthcare. I've sat with the chairman of the main healthcare regulator, thinking through how all their staff can get involved in understanding at the coalface, what are patients really suffering from? What do they really need rather than sitting in their ivory tower? So I'm very excited about this. I, my personal belief is that charities are in a bit of difficulty at the moment. And I don't have to, I don't have to say that. You, you're reading it every day. And the charities that I'm most concerned about are the larger charities. Because for all the reasons we've talked about, I mean, we, we've talked about the various players in this, or Jonathan did, corporations, the state, and charities. But none of us have talked about the media. And at this moment, the media has shifted its dial onto looking at voluntarism, charities, whatever else. And I, I'm actually quite worried about large charities. And I, my theory is that the old model is beginning to disintegrate. And we actually need to see new models coming through. And I loved some of the language you were using, Kozar, because you didn't talk about charities. You were talking about community action. And, and I think we're going to see a whole new language coming into this space of volunteerism. I hate the word volunteer, by the way. If I ask you if you'd like to volunteer for health force, which is what we say to enterprise support, you may say you're <coughs> If I ask you if you'd like to help, it's very hard for you to say in there. <laughs> and you might mean it too, by the way. <laughs> and I also think we're going to have to think of ways of creating volunteerism without money. And as we move into the world of Bitcoin and blockchains and other things. I And again, we, the two of us were talking about this just before. We've got so many other talents that we can give. We can give ourselves, we can give our time. And finally, just to remind you, uh, my friend, good friend, Prof Legrand, is the Titmus professor. And the good once was, or still is, was, was. And if you ever want to read a book about a social movement on steroids, read his book, about the giving of blood, and when we all first asked to give blood in the 1960s, and it just went viral. And I think, I'm very, very optimistic. I think volunteerism is going to take over, because actually, our trust, as my colleagues have already said, both in the state, but perhaps in big charities too, is beginning to wane. So what are we going to do in the field of healthcare? I think we're going to take control of the NHS back into our own hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, well, we'll now um, open for discussion. Um, I shall abuse my position as chair by asking the first uh, question. Um, and uh, you've all mentioned trust, the question of trust. Um, from, obviously, we're in some sense a crisis of trust at the moment from Jimmy Savile, uh, Kids Company, uh, Oxfam, Save the Children. Um, if you were um, advising Oxfam at this moment, what would you suggest to them to try and rebuild their trust? Can I ask all three of you separately for that? <coughs> and I'm very glad I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, there is quite a lot of literature on trust repair, actually, and what you have to do. And um, uh, Oxfam tried to do it a bit, but did it far too slowly. Uh, the first thing you have to do in a situation like that is hold your hands up and say, we got it horribly, dreadfully, appallingly wrong. 
and we're going to do absolutely everything possible. We're going to release every single document, all that stuff. And unfortunately, they didn't do that. They uh, produced things bit by bit, and it looked like they were still trying to get out of this this mess. So um, that would be my advice to Oxfam, and then just um, they're going to have to see how it goes. But I I fear for Oxfam actually because. There are so many other organisations of a similar kind that you can give your donations to. Um, there are so many other organisations you can give your volunteer time to. Um, so we should just have to see how it uh, plays out. Well, um, I must disclose an interest at this stage, uh, not in Oxfam, but I've recently become a trustee at an international um, aid organization called Muslim Aid, which is uh, one of the largest charities uh, raising for Muslim communities and giving to communities across the world. We've got offices in over 90 countries. And so we are one of the charities who got the letter from the Secretary of State uh, saying uh, you must disclose all such incidences which um, have affected Oxfam. And one of the things which has struck me uh, in my time as a trustee there is the scale of operation for some of these huge charities. When you have operations in 90 countries and you as a trustee and a board are responsible effectively for those operations in 90 countries, it's impossible to manage unless you have coherent governance, uh, your constitution says that there is separation between the entity here and the entity overseas, it's almost impossible uh, to untangle the connections, but also the risks that, that are associated with operations locally. Um, and I hope, I think the challenges which Oxfam are facing in particular are very significant challenges. It, I can say these are challenges, I think, which will, I mean, there's a lot more to come, I think, um, and it will affect other charities. Um, and there's a real crisis in confidence. Um, but I think the, the extraordinary work Oxfam does and other charities, um, we mustn't overlook that. I think there's always cha challenges, um, but it's about strengthening, strengthening that system of governance. And one of the big questions which uh, is often asked in the international aid and development sector is actually localism, this new debate about um, these international organisations almost following the old colonial model of being based in London and servicing, you know, going over there and <coughs> providing uh, education programmes to locals, um, you know, those individuals from Western countries coming over to Africa, for example, to de deliver those programmes. So I think one of the things this um, crisis might do is open up some of those questions a bit more and say, actually, Maybe we need to fragment the current system and accelerate that debate. Mm -hmm. Tom, Gosh, I, I would first of all, I'd hope not to be asked the question. I think, but um, I, uh, apart from repeating what's already been said, I, which I think I agree with all of what's been said, actually, um, I think I think I might go and talk to the media uh, personally. Um, I think I'd like to talk to Rupert Murray and the Times team, and say, do you understand what damage you're doing? And is, is it really giving you pleasure doing this? Mm. Um, I felt very much the same when I woke up on Saturday morning and read about Brendan Cox, and I thought, has the owner of the mail really thought this through? I mean, I, I don't, I'm not commenting on Brendan Cox one way or the other, but, but yes, we need transparency, yes, we need freedom of speech, but... I am deeply concerned that large charities on whom may, all of us are extremely dependent, be it for researching into our breast cancer, our prostate cancer, into our Alzheimer's, be it looking after foster children in this country, that there's going to be an open day of criticism on a, one of the most precious parts of our society that is envied around the world. Uh, and that spent, we've spent, since the poor law in the 16th century, we, we've spent building. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply worried about that. As far as Oxfam's itself is concerned, I think I would say to Mark Golding, who I know well and I have a huge respect for, 
hold your nerve. Hold your nerve. You, you run a wonderful organisation. He ran MenCap before brilliantly. Uh, hold your nerve. Just keep apologising. But go back. You know, there'll be some ghastly disaster somewhere. And we'll all forget about Oxford for a bit. Get on with the job and close the door. And that's how I chair the hospital I run, which is I always say to our team, ignore all the press. Don't whinge about the amount of money we've got. Just focus on how can we deliver the best care that's delivered in this country to, the, to our local folk. And finally, I agree with you. I, I, I do think that um, there's been too much emphasis on consolidation in the charity world. And Sir Robert Armstrong, one of the most brilliant of cabinet secretaries 20 years ago, probably now, wasn't it? No. He, he was a huge anti on charities merging. He said, I don't get it. I mean, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let's have lots of innovative, impatient voluntarists who want to make a difference in life rather than turning it into an industry. So I, I look forward to fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Well, open to discussion and debate. Yes, oh, oh there's, there are microphones. And could you uh, identify yourself? <coughs> Yeah, Bernard Casey from Frankfurt. Um, I came specially for this. Um, at the opening of the uh, Beverage 2000 Festival a few months ago, I did raise this issue of voluntary action, and I more or less quoted what um, Miss Hughes Hall quoted. I said it was very interesting that almost nobody had actually read or seemed to refer to um, the 1948 uh, report. <coughs> One of the points that I raised at that time was um, under the heading of public service in the time of austerity and demographic trends, and I actually talked on that. I, I, I gave the example then of um, private pensions and um, auto enrolment under private pensions, and I raised the issue of nudge policy. He, somebody did mention nudge very briefly, but I think there seems to be a large element of what governments are actually encouraging us to do semi-privately for supposedly our good, but also for the government's good. And I think that that is something we need to discuss. A second thing, and I'm going to introduce that only very briefly, is this issue of trust. I mean, I have been looking at social investment plans, and I've been looking at this from the other side. So I've been talking to people in the city and in the sort of big society capital world about what they are doing. And it is remarkably self it is remarkably self satisfied that these people appear to be with a complete lack of metrics on how you actually show mm -hmm. that there has been an impact. And that, that is the point which again was brought up earlier. There, this, this whole social investment industry, which is being promoted not only by governments in this country but across the rest of the world, is terribly fragile on the basis of what it is really doing. And since we're talking about ex-directors, we should remember that the ex-director has a daughter who is involved in one of, one of our ex-directors in one of the big organizations. And I have talked to her, and I get no indication whatsoever about what these indicators are. Thank you. Um, I think I'll take a few more questions, because um, we are running short of time. So I think we'll, and then we'll, uh, then I'll turn to the panel to ask them to react to some or all the questions. Hi there, thank you. Uh, my name is Edward Millett. I'm studying the legal practice course in the area, so my question is directed to CASA primarily, but to all of you. Um, we've noticed that legal aid is pulled back and the state is pulled back, and in, into that void, um, uh, legal advice centers around London uh, have come. And in my experience from working in uh, Latimer Road in the shadow of Grenfell Tower and in uh, Stratford as well for legal advice centers, has shown me that the work and the people working there, volunteers from all parts of the legal industry, do brilliant work. But I just my question is really, how do we join up that thinking? How do we make that more kind of coherent? Thank you. More questions? Actually, it sort of leads on from that conveniently. Thank you. Um, yes, is uh, volunteerism or however you want to pronounce it as a noun, synonymous with amateurism? And is this a problem in terms of how it's funded and how it's resourced? So I speak as both somebody who's volunteered for 
big multi-state organisations like the Commonwealth Secretariat and also very much in my own community um, for a lifetime. So I think we're particularly hard on charities when relentlessly we get them to declare how much they're spending in terms of admin costs and without actually knowing uh, from our own professional insight or any direct experience, the actual associated costs of governance, of safeguarding. So without wanting to implicate us all, I think as a society, we are part of the problem in not really understanding uh, the whole mechanism of volunteering. Um, so is that question of, is it synonymous with um, amateurism and that lack of uh, professionalism? Um, and also how we fund it. Because really, uh, congratulations to Sir Thomas for putting his hand in the pocket and now seeing the results hugely, really. Um, but also it's very much about what was said uh, by Jonathan, I believe. Wanting to do good is no longer uh, enough. So comments, thank you. Okay. So, um, Kaza, do you want to respond on the legal questions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge challenge uh, Funding is a big deal of legal aid, um, and cuts in legal aid um, have caused or will cause lots of um, actually the opposite of what we we're talking about earlier about fragmentation. I think um, the demands of law society or, or legal advice centres across London, in particular, for example, will lead to people clubbing together um, because of a lack of resources. Um, we've seen that at Toynbee Hall, I've seen that at Battersea. Legal Advice Centre, I've seen that at other places. I just want to touch upon the other point you mentioned about um, amateurism. I, I mean, in, in my new role, one of the things which has struck me is the way <coughs> that some charities are run. You'd never find charities run in the, way, in the same way as private sector organisations are run. I mean, they, the day and light difference. And I think there's a lot of scrutiny which is placed upon charities saying, you know, how much are you paying your talent, but if charities don't put their hands in their pocket and pay for the best talent, then often there is, you get people who um, are of a, a less um, well-equipped set of skills often entering into the charitable sector as a result. And I think that's a big dilemma we face in charities. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think two different questions, one about nudge, and one about social investment and metrics of returns. Um, on Nudge, I suppose that's a different sort of voluntarism we're talking about, in that the voluntarism we've been talking about here is about voluntary action and people coming together. The voluntarism in terms of Nudge is, do we allow people the right to make their decisions voluntarily, or does the government seek to manipulate them in some way did you think about supplementing the state? That was the, that was the context in which I right. was I mean, it was uh, okay. supplementing what the state couldn't do with respect to pensions with what private individuals sufficiently nudged sure. could do. Sure. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, my feeling is that that societally, we're getting into the issue of how much taxation we should be having to, uh, which was uh, in that... Um, in that lecture you're referring to was something of an omission about whether that was the way forward to finance the welfare state further taxation. Um, I think uh, maybe it also comes down to what uh, Sir Tom was saying about is the purpose of the welfare state a basic minimum and it's up to the individual to do more and then the next question is if the individual isn't doing more and could should the state find fairly Machiavellian ways of nudging them to, to do more? Um, it's a very interesting question. I don't really have the answer. There are obviously lots of ethical questions about nudge strategies. Um, just briefly, the idea of nudge is that um, you people retain their choice, but you manipulate the architecture around that choice to encourage them to do things that you think are in their interests. So there's an ethical dilemma about whether you're really controlling what they do. Um, so I think it's a great question, and I, I don't have an absolute answer on that. In terms of social investment and um, metrics, for sure social investment does not uh, have perfect metrics at all. There is an awful lot of work going on in trying to create metrics. There's a problem with making the social into numbers. 
there always is because social outcomes are so difficult to measure, to quantify. Um, but I think the social investments should be allowed some time to see whether it can work and whether more sophisticated measures can be um, developed. That would be my response. Tom is doing good enough. <sighs> well, I don't think if it, I, I don't think if it's in an amateur way. No, I mean, first of all, I think amateur sort of denotes a criticism. So I'm not suggesting you're making, but it sounds like a criticism. I mean, um, I did some work in Essex for the Essex County Council on this whole in this whole area, and one of the things we got going with. Um, uh, parties of young, young-ish school children, their mid-teens, was called EastEnders Hour. And they gave up EastEnders once a week uh, in their own house and found someone in the street who was watching it, who was on their own. Uh, and that elderly individual then cooked them tea, watched EastEnders with them, <coughs> and then they went home. Now, that's totally amateur, in a way, but it's totally wonderful. <laughs> Um, and I think the key to this is what you asked about the law firms around, uh, the legal volunteers around Latimer Road. And in fact, David Robinson and some of us were discussing this at lunchtime. How do we join it all up? That's the really big challenge in this. I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you, except that I think it's going to be, which we are seeing in some places, in some quite unusual places, Barking and Dagenham is a very good example in London, where the communities are really trying to come together as communities now, very often assisted by the local authority, to help make these networks glue together. I'm a huge fan of community foundations. London made the huge mistake of only having one for a city of 10 million people. It was bonkers. Uh, but if you go into the counties, community foundations are really linking up um, some of these community networks now. So is doing good good enough? Well, it's a good start. <laughs> and on that note, I'm afraid we'll have to draw this to a close. We're already 10 minutes over. Um, however, um, you are all invited to a drinks reception just outside the door. Um, and uh, there will be an opportunity for uh, us to individually um, uh, ask our panellists. Um, but in the meantime, um, many thanks to our speakers for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, and debate, and um, perhaps you could just join, join me in expressing your appreciation. <laughs>